So we begin. I found this picture of this tree on the internet and for me it was very instructive looking at the trunk, how big the tree is. I also imagine the roots that it should have to be able to carry the entire trunk as well as what it will have on it, maybe the fruits and the different branches. And so the idea of being rooted therefore means that it should have a firm place where how it stands so that every other thing how it spreads out will not really disbalance this tree the, the figure i want us to bear in mind in this our short reflection that we shall have together and from the perspective of the word of god because that's our focus today. And like I said at the introduction, the two sides to it, the rooted part, is the part that has to do with it, the charismatic part, what we have to do, how we have to live, the implications for us, and then the being audacious, how we now go out, the one on mission, that at the end of this session, Father Rosa will also talk about. The general outline of our reflection is, as you can see, we have the general introduction, then the claret and the word of God, then the congregation and the word of God, then a special uh, reflection on being with him, which is actually taken from the Gospel of Mark, Mark 3, 13 to 14, so being with him has to be rooted, and then we'll have the conclusion. We know this very well, that we are listeners and servants of the word of God, and this is already part of our heritage as Claritians, and so we need to bear this in mind, too, that how can we truly be rooted in this word of God that we are listeners and servants of? It is a charismatic call within the church and which we also leave out. And as prophets of apostolate, you also uh, have to animate. And so in view of the life and the mission of the congregation, your role is very central. And it's also something we'll also think about and try to live through in these uh, few moments that we'll have this reflection. The Word of God, the sacred scripture, is one of the greatest literatures in the whole world, as you know. And this is true when we look at also the form that it has, different from other profane writings, the literary region, the content. And then it goes without saying then that it does not belong to the ordinary level of the things that we read, but it is inspired. It is the Word of God, the Word of God committed to writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. And it's also sometimes referred to as the Word of God in human language. And so, it reveals the entire Christ event, the plan of God for humanity. And this is where we want to be rooted. This is what we're talking about. So, in the scriptures, therefore, God speaks, acts, and commits himself to us continuously through his word. And we know, you know, as a general way, that we have the Old Testament, which will be the record of promise, preparation, with all the prophecies that are forward-looking, and then the New Testament which is the record of fulfillment, the culmination of everything that has been promised in the Old Testament. And so we find these two that we have to deal with all the time and also understand the fact that it is a way of living that also presents the fact that we are called to be part of God's own plan, his plan for us, his plan for the entire world, 
which we have to live through, understand, and work with. Now, talking about this word, Jesus as word of God, the Logos, as we read in the Gospel of John, and Arche and Hall Logos, in the beginning was the word. And so these words that we read are not dead words or just written and mute, but they are living words. You can look at that image, you know, how life-giving it is. Through the word of the scripture, God alters but one word, his only begotten son, Jesus himself, in whom he fully alters himself. In effect, Jesus Christ is the incarnate word of Father who definitively proclaims the liberating plan of God. And so, because it's a word that is alive, alive and active, it also gives life to every human person that encounters it. So one who is rooted in it is rooted in life. You can see even from the face of this uh, lady that is embraced by this word of God, you see the life in it, the smile. All of this will mean, therefore, that it is an encounter with God each time the word of God is read, the scriptures are read. This is why faith is needed to better appreciate this revelation of God through the written word. The word of God is living and effective, giving life to those who receive it. It's a mirror that helps us to know ourselves from the viewpoint of God. And so we're transformed by this same word of God in order to better understand too this word that we listen to all the time. Having given this general introduction to this uh, uh, reflection, now we'll talk about claret, claret as the word of God, uh, her, her, his own relationship with the word of God. And so for claret, the word of God was at the center of his life and of his ministry too as the founder. He considered the word of God not just as the instrument of his work, but more importantly as a way of encountering the Lord in different activities of every follower and especially every clerician. So that means therefore that the word of God is not just what we have to preach to others, but we ourselves have to be rooted in it. It has to transform us. And so that transformation should always be part of what we should aspire to have, the Word of God as the source of our being and as also what will give life to the one who listens to it. Claret lived and carried out his mission with full awareness of the centrality of the Word of God. Times he read the Bible Many times, the focus of his preaching, what also made him even to carry out certain actions. So, he was deeply influenced by the actions and responses of the prophets and the apostles. So, the personages in the Bible, the prophets, the apostles, all of those who followed the will of God, who sought his will, were people that inspired Claret in everything that he did. And so this he also got from the word of God. Then he nurtured his relationship with God with the nourishment he received from reading the word of God. You know, we can imagine the number of times he actually even con re read more during the Lenten season you know, instead of the usual one chapter that he will read during the Lenten season for his own nourishment, spiritual nourishment, to decide to leave his work of manufacturing, he also remembered the text of the scriptures 
What does it profit a man to gain the whole world and then suffer the loss of his soul? And that became the springboard, what inspired him to make the decision about his vocation. Claret also was formed by the word, and he saw himself as sent to proclaim the good news to the poor. Immediately we can think here of Luke's Gospel, chapter 4, verses 16 to 19. And you know, that quotation from Isaiah, Claret from that same way like that of the prophet to preach the good news to the poor but also he himself listened you know in attentive meditation to this word he was rooted in it before he went out to preach so we see therefore this important one which goes on to tell us what we also need to think about on how we need to live and do our own things as people who are following his footsteps in the work of evangelization. And the Blessed Virgin Mary, who kept the word of God in her heart, was also one who formed her. So we find out, therefore, that the spirituality of Claret was a spirituality that was biblical spirituality. That meant also the whole fact that the Bible was at the center of his, of his life. This is the... To also highlight in this our reflection how it relates to Claret as he lived his life daily taking cognizance of the Bible. So we move to the next phase, which is the congregation. Like you know very well, our congregation places a lot of emphasis on the centrality of the Word of God in the life and mission of the congregation. One of the general chapters, the one of 1991, focuses or focused on this dimension of our ministry and was the center of the congregational reflection during the celebration of the 21st general chapter. And so we had out of this, you know, the document, Servants of the World, and the word in the new evangelization. So this chapter, this general chapter, focused on the importance and the role, the centrality of this word of God denomination as servants of the word, you know, in a missionary service of the word. And so it's also at the core and one of the one of the things bequeathed by Claret to the congregation is also this love of the word of God being rooted in this word of God. And the congregation has taken this very seriously to make it actually the point of reflection of an entire general chapter, the 21st general chapter, uh, which was also done here in Rome, as I said earlier, in 1991. Therefore, the approach of the congregation is, is, there, is from this perspective, not just to relegate it or put it on one side, but to, to put it right decision-making body of the congregation which a general chapter, it was actually at the center of the reflection. And I think it's an important thing. It's indicative of its importance too for us. And also for the congregation, the word of God is at the center of the life of every missionary. Therefore, in our constitutions number three, we read that the following of Christ are set forth in the gospel is our supreme rule, gospel now. You, see, you can see that in red, uh, which is an important part that also shows this, the gospel then becomes the central point that shows what this rule is. And so we listen to the Lord's words, eager to learn from him as he calls his disciples, 
Father is perfect as he gives them the new commandment of fraternal love. And number 37, our missionaries should spend some time daily in mental prayer an hour when possible, pondering the word of God in their hearts. We should enjoy reading, especially from the scripture, and examine our fidelity to the gospel. So this whole point, therefore, shows this, which is taking up again in the constitutions on what we need to do and how we need to do it, time we need to devote to it. All of this pointing to the fact that we need to be rooted in this word of God, expressed as being the supreme rule set forth through the gospel and also the time we dedicate to the reading of the scriptures as a way of also developing this closeness to God and being rooted in his word. And so, number 46 of the constitutions, we have the ministry of the world through which we communicate the total mystery of Christ to humanity is our special calling among the people of God. See that, that's, that's actually very central to, you know, our mission is about this word of God. Our special calling among the people of God is this ministry of the word. For we have been sent to proclaim the Lord's life, death, and resurrection, the Christ event, until he comes so that all who believe in him may be saved. This is our mission, and this is what we need to do. So the centrality of the word of God as our own vocation is that which we always have to bear in mind. And this is what also our constitution uh, says to us in this regard. The ministry of the world is not just an appendage. It's not an appendage to our mission, just as we read in our missionary Sumos number 42. But it is, and I think it's important, the charismatic heritage, our own charismatic heritage, defines us as listeners and servants of the world. Because of the missionary character of our vocation as clarions, we also contemplate and announce the word using the best means possible. And the act of contemplating, which is important in this phase of our reflection, is this act of being rooted in. It is the act of taking upon ourselves this whole point that we remain with him, we reflect, just as the Constitution tells us, you know, to read and meditate. And so that reflection, that contemplation, and then the announcing, therefore, you know, we'll, after having, you know, been inspired by the word that we have listened to in attentive meditation and contemplation, we'll be able to announce it to others. And so, we also still find this too in the general chapter document, you know, of this, uh, the, the last general chapter, the 25th general chapter, which says our charismatic heritage defines us as listeners and servants of the word. It is possible for us to continue this, but only if we are truly rooted and radically rooted in this word of God. And I think it's an important thing that we need to think about. So this ends this part of the congregation and the word of God. We shall now continue uh, to the third one, which is being with him. That means to be rooted. Being with the Lord. I, I also still found this picture of being with the Lord, uh, the one where Jesus visited the family of Mary and Martha, and Mary listening to the voice, to the word of, from the master, Jesus, and then Martha running around with other things that, you know, had to also do with taking care of the house and probably what they were going to eat afterwards. 
listening. When Jesus called his apostles, his disciples, in Mark's Gospel, chapter 3, verses 13 to 14, he called them so that they would be with him and then to be sent out. It is that being with, really, that created that act of being rooted in him. So the phrase to be with him evokes the image of a disciple, a disciple who listens, a disciple who is a student, a disciple a disciple is always at the feet of the master, listening, paying attention, watching, learning. This is exactly what we, we can deduce from what Mary did at the feet of Jesus when he came to their house. And in order to be rooted truly, we have to also have this manner of living, that contemplative side, to be able to listen, to be able to hear him, to be able to follow his path. And so the disciple is always at the feet of the master, listening, paying attention to him, watching him, learning. And even in in the manner are in the things that are not even said. This disciple keeps learning. And so the strength of the disciple, therefore, lies in this ability to live out these qualities of listening, of paying attention, of watching, of learning. And this is exactly the same attitude that will be needed for anyone who will want to be rooted in the word of God. And also for all our prophets of apostolate, you know, like yourself too, you know, this attitude will also be one that is required of you. And so, being with, we have at least four characteristics of a disciple that are deducible from our constitutions, number four, you know, and then we can add others, you know, related to these two. And these are outlined here. So I have seven of them here, and maybe you might also be able to add a little more to it, you know, in your own reflection. Listening to his word, eagerness to learn, fraternal love, and prayer. And then we can add availability and openness, love of the master, and self-sacrifice. These elements, these characteristics, are the characteristics that every disciple is supposed to cultivate in order to be truly rooted in the teachings of the master. Listening. And that listening, you know, like, you know, Shema, is not just hearing something but goes beyond it to actually that obedience. You know, Shema Yisrael Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Echad. That act of listening is not just hearing something spoken to us, but beyond it is the fact that there is the attitude of openness to obey and, you know, working towards that an eagerness to learn because as a disciple is a student mathetes a student and so the student should be open to learn because he does not know and so has to open himself eager to learn from the master in order to be truly solid in the teachings of the master and the way the things Uh, the way he has to live his life, behave, following the dictates of the master. And then fraternal love, fraternal love and prayer. All of these two, because they also have the parts they play, especially in being with the others within the community of disciples under the same master 
and learning and working and being together. Openness and availability, you know, is a character or a characteristics that when a disciple cultivates this, he will therefore have the capacity to prepare him or herself to move out beyond the present and wherever he or she may be to wherever the master will want him to be. And then love of the master. If you love me, you will do what I command you, say Jesus. And so a disciple cannot but love his master. And that's an important thing. Ability to make self sac to make self sacrifices and then understand the fact that it is important for him to know that being with the master, he also has to sacrifice everything for the mission that the master is giving to him. So the implications is the word, the one to be with is the word of God. That's Jesus himself. Therefore, being with him has the following transformational implications. The first one is the epistemological transformational implication, episteme, you know, knowledge. The second one is the spiritual transformational implication, being with him, also transforms spiritually. And then the third one is the interpersonal or communitarian uh, transformational implications. So these, these uh, implications are important because also it is in being with him that we are rooted and then we become rooted even the more when we have this transformation go on within us as disciples of the Lord. And so we'll know about him, we'll be spiritually charged and built up to be able to face the mission. And then the first place of mission is also the community where we have uh, the interpersonal relationship, just as uh, the document of our general chapter says that to be a community is not just, it's not a, a noun. It is actually a verb. So not just a noun where we have to do something. And so we find out that this interpersonal relationship too manifests our rootedness in the Word of God, our rootedness in Christ. So we take them one after the other. The epistemological transformation here, the focus is that the disciple, by the fact of his position, knows very little or nothing because he's a student. And therefore, he needs the master to enlighten him. So in being with him, which is... Uh, the point of departure, Jesus explains things to his disciples. And that's what we find here, you know, under the tree, different people listening to him, you know, learning and the things that they have to do. So, for instance, we have the text of Matthew fifteen fifteen, But Peter said to him, explain this parable to us. And so, you know, they wanted to know that eagerness. So to be rooted, we also have to develop this sense of eagerness, this curiosity to know actually what to do. And in order to know what to do, we need to ask questions too. There has to be some closeness. And that rapport is important. Then with many parables... Jesus spoke the word to them to the extent that they could understand. He did not speak to them except in parables, but he explained everything in private to his disciples. You see then, there's an epistemological transformation for them because now he explained everything. They became wiser. They knew more. They are, they are introduced to the mystery of the kingdom. So it's not just one of knowing like every other person, one who is rooted in him has a greater commitment, has a greater knowledge, has, is one who is with him that also is the mystery of the kingdom is opened 
and explained to him. So the disciple is constantly in need of directives and wisdom of the master. Therefore, the disciple will be able to know the mind, the modus operandi, the content of the teaching of the master, and it is necessary for he should have in course of his being with the master. The element is achievable through the acts of listening, eagerness to learn. These are very important attitudes of disciples. And that's exactly you know, what we had also underscored at the beginning. A disciple who is eager to listen, eager to learn, will also have this epistemological transformation. And so, other instances, uh, you know, we also find here in Luke's Gospel, chapter 10, verse 22, you know, these whole things that point to knowing, the idea of knowing, which I also underscore here, you know, and it says, all things have been handed over to me by my Father, and no one knows, you know, epistemology. Who the son is except the father, and the father except who the son is, and the one whom he chooses to reveal, you know. And that revelation is supernatural way of knowing, revealing. And then he says again in the next verse, Blessed are your eyes, for they see what you see now. And then the next one, he says, I tell you, many prophets and kings desire to see what you see, but did not see it, and hear what he hear, but never heard it. So all these elements point out this whole idea of epistemology, knowledge, knowledge of God, which is, which can only be heard when one is with the master. And so that's why we say being with him it means being rooted, and that has to do with constant touch with the word of God, with the Logos himself, Christ, and then the scriptures that we read where God himself reveals himself to us in human language. The second one is the spiritual transformation. Uh, you can see this like the day of Pentecost, Peter speaking boldly. He was no longer afraid of the Jews Peter, who denied the, the master in the presence of a little maid, now speaks before everybody. And so Peter's speech on the day of Pentecost, Acts of the Apostles, chapter 2, verses 14 to 41, the Holy Spirit becomes evidently active in the disciple when there is this transformation that takes place. That is the spiritual transformation. But the Advocate, the Holy Spirit, whom the Father will send in my name, will teach you everything and remind you all that I have said to you. And so it is the action of the Spirit then on this level that leads to this transformation. And that transformation comes also because also of that openness. But it is part of exactly what the Father uh, will give to us when we remain with his son whom he has sent. A disciple through his attentive listening to the master and openness to learn from the master is transformed from his state of from his state to becoming a better person and another master to the world. So this is the implication and is particularly evident in the elements of the prayer as well as the transformative power of listening to the word of God. You know, Word of God will help in this in arriving at this uh, spiritual transformation of the individual of the disciple who is following. So, the essential element of discipleship is being steeped in the Spirit. Thus, it is no longer we who live, but Christ lives in us. This is an important and indispensable aspect of missionary life and discipleship. In order to achieve this transformation, we have to be steeped. We have to be soaked in it. Being with the Lord, therefore, will transform our being in such a way that, you know, we 
can represent him in the world. We're transformed in that way. And then we are rooted in, in him. Now let's go to the last one, which is the communitarian interpersonal uh, transformation. You know, I found this picture, like I said earlier on about the other ones too, on the internet. And when I saw this, I looked at the different phases. And I, I'd like you to look at the different phases and even how each person is walking with Jesus right in front, whom he is talking with. Some at the back we cannot see. And they're living together as a community. And we're thinking about an interpersonal and community transformation in this regard. What will this be, really? And I uh, would think that in this particular case, therefore, there will be at least three kinds of transformation in this on this communitarian level, which we'll see, you know, later on, which will be the master-disciple relationship, disciple-disciple relationship, and then relationship within the community as a whole. You know, on these three levels, we find this type of relationship that will take place. And so, Jesus with the twelve, a community, the community of the disciples with the master, then turning to the disciples, Jesus said to them privately, the text that we read already, you know, so he turns to them. It, 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 that, that text of the scripture already creates that relationship the, that is exclusively of his and his disciples. And then in other places we read, Jesus called his 12 disciples together. He gave them power over all the bad spirit or unclean spirits as some translations have, and the power to heal the sick people, send them out to people about, and then to talk to people about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. So, you see, this is given to the, his disciples. He called them aside. So it's a community that is living together. And so we know that Jesus chose these 12 people in our text, and then he calls to mind the life of this new group of people, the criteria of their relationship with each other. And so we say we can decipher at least three levels of relationship. Jesus and his disciples, master-disciple master relationship, disciple-disciple relationship, so, you know, on one of the occasions, the, the, the sons of Zebedee, John, and James asking for some position, and then they became indignant amongst themselves, and why are they asking for this, and all of that. And then the, the, the last one, the relationship within the community as a whole, the presence of Jesus within the community, how it also transforms. And so the idea of the community then, we think of the different characters of each of these people we have seen, the disciples, the personal ambition of each of them, those who want to be on the right and the left in his kingdom, the differences that we find in each person, the different roles that each one has to play within the community, Peter having his role, Judas had his role, each one with his own thing, those who were sent to go and look for the uh, ass that Jesus will ride to enter Jerusalem, and so on and so forth. The strengths and weaknesses of each of them, the plurality and its attendant complexities, the unifying presence of Jesus within the community. All of these, you know, put together will show us the dynamics of this community, the community that we are talking about here, which is the community that Jesus is at the center and is the source of everything that they are going to do. So putting all of this together then, we realize that the transformation that takes place on this level 
is a transformation that helps the disciples to live together in the community with the master, looking at him as the one, the source of everything that they have to do, as well as the one who inspires, the one they have to look at, look up to, live with, and carry out his mission. Everything that he asks of them, everything that he says that they should do. And so, we also know that in some of these, there are occasions where you have friction within the community. And that's, that's why I brought out this text of the two sons of Zebedee in Mark's Gospel, chapter 10, uh, verses 35 to 45. And then, you know, they came forward to him and said, Teacher, one, uh, grant us to sit, one on your right and one on your left in your glory. But Jesus said to them, you don't know what you're asking. And then at the end of it, when the ten heard of this, they became, they began to be angry with James and John. And so, now, the intervention of the master. And this is where being rooted in him and in his word, where it will take us to. And that is, he says, among the Gentiles, they lord it over those who are under them. They become tyrants. And then he says, this is not what is supposed to happen with you. In fact, the greatest among you must be your servant because I, as the master, have come to serve and not to be served and to give my life as a ransom for many. So he gives the, let's call it, the Jesus paradigm, which is different from what was happening within the, within the community. So even while with Jesus we have this kind of conflict and the, and the you know, bad blood coming on amongst them. But each time this happened, he still showed them and told them what exactly they need to do, how they need to behave, the things that they need to pay attention to, the paradigm he had come to also establish, how they also need to bear in mind his own calling. And so when they became angry, then he says, the paradigm is to serve. And so being rooted in him then makes us servants of everyone within the community and in all the things that we do. Therefore, brothers, being rooted means being with him, being with Jesus. It means being a servant of all. Being rooted in him is also to contemplate the word and deepen the mystical dimension of our life. Being rooted in him is to incarnate personally the charism of the congregation as listeners and servants of the word. So these whole ideas put together then present what we truly should be in dealing or in talking about being rooted, rooted in the word of God. And finally, to put everything together, we live like Claret, the centrality of the word of God. And this is expressed and lived out daily. We find the answers to the challenges of life in the word of God. The prophetic dimension of our ministry is nourished by the word of God. The personalization of the word of God characterizes our spirituality. And these elements, five of them stated, are things that show our being rooted in God, in the word of God, in the one that he has sent to us, the Logos himself. And then this way, we'll be able to also live it out and then 
do the second part of our reflection today, which is being audacious. So it is my hope that, you know, uh, this whole act of being rooted in the Word of God, which we have at the beginning, uh, will also make us to have these very deep roots, solid, to be able to carry out our spreading out to various parts of the world doing our mission. And so this act of being audacious, going to different places, will still keep us firmly rooted in the Lord and in this place that he has brought each and every one of us to participate in, that is, in his mission. So like I said earlier, uh, the second part, being audacious, uh, will be taken by Father Rosa. Thank you for listening, and I hope that this is also uh, useful and will be useful for your further reflection. Thank you very much.